Uh, I'm just double checking here. Are we alive? <laughs> I think I believe we are. Ah, yes, 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 we are alive. <laughs> okay, so welcome everyone again to uh, live chat with Mr. Leong Zi Hien. Um, so today, to start off, um, um, as, as usual, what you all can do is just to key in what you would like to hear both of us talk about uh, and also for us to re uh, respond to your questions. Uh, so to start off, what we have today is to talk about COVID. Wow. Of, uh, yeah, the COVID. Hot, hot topic of the day. But, but, but when you talk about COVID, it's not about, uh, we're not talking about, oh, uh, the how dangerous the virus is we are not talking about uh how uh, whether or not you go for vaccination we are talking we are talking about how effective the government so far has been tackling the covid uh, situation in singapore um mr what 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 do you think about the uh the way how the task force have been managing it so far uh, perhaps let me start by as usual talking about the numbers lah. Mm -hmm. let the numbers Talk for the yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to start off uh, talking a bit about uh, decision theory. Now, I'm not an expert on <laughs> decision theory, uh, it's just that I'm trying to remember what I studied when I was 22 years old. I took a self-study course, uh, Diploma in Organization and Methods, uh, mm. and nine papers from the Institute of Administrative Management in the United Kingdom, right? So, the decision theory, from what I can remember, uh, the most basic the rule of thumb is that uh, before you do any before you make a decision you look at the numbers what do you mean by look at the numbers let me give you an example mm -hmm. let's say I'm trying to decide whether I should do this right so I need to look and see eh, are other people doing this or not okay and let's say I'm trying to decide oh Maybe I should not. I I should not do anything, right? Then I have to look around and say, hey, are most people not doing anything like me, or are most people doing something that I'm doing nothing? So this is most basic, huh? And let me give you an example for COVID nineteen. Uh, in Jan in the late January uh, two zero one uh, two zero two zero when COVID first started, huh? uh, we were still letting people come into Singapore. A lot of Chinese tourists were coming when. Uh, other countries were already starting to ban them from coming yeah. in. No? So this comes back to my earlier uh, brief, uh, simple explanation of decision theory. Uh, when we made the decision to continue to allow these people to come in, uh, did we look around and say, hey, many, many countries actually stopped them coming in. So why, why were we the odd, the odd person out in a sense? You know, and, and, and an example on the, uh, what I call not not doing something. Uh. Uh, look at the recent spike in cases, all the imported cases uh, and local cases. Now, uh, you look around, you see most countries are not allowing people to come in. No? So, uh, why why do we uh, be the odd man out? So, this, this, uh, this is what I like to start off with, like, you know, uh, uh, decision theory, uh, you know, let the numbers do the talking. Okay, so... Um have you saw? Uh, have you have you seen the uh, the press conference that uh, the multi ministry task force conducted to to tell people that uh, that we are heightening the um, the social the control measures? Yes, uh, yes, yeah. yes. I did. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, so so basically, what the uh, ministers have been saying is that we are effectively. Uh, I think it was Lawrence Wong who said effectively we are going back to phase two. I think to a lot of people. They are, they are very frustrated. They feel very frustrated in the sense that they have been uh, putting their effort uh, to, to adhere to social distancing control measures, putting out their masks for, I think, over one year? Have you? Yes, yeah, yes, yes. Uh, over, over, uh, has been over, over a year. Um, yes, is it May already? Ah, yes, over a year uh, uh, to, to follow all these measures. And yet, we are seeing a second wave, uh, I wouldn't say second wave, a second time where we would possibly see a lockdown. 
okay, sorry, circuit breaker uh, in Singapore. And all these attributes to uh, most likely imported cases. Because for, I believe it was last year, we had a period in which we managed to uh, lower the complete cases to zero for, over, uh, for 15 days until uh, uh, subsequently uh, another case came came in and the only if we were to follow the the assumption that the virus would only be communicable within 14 days right the virus definitely had come from somewhere overseas it's important uh so some uh some netizen somehow say that oh it's airborne and and, and therefore you can't control well, it's like for for god's sake uh, airborne yes or airborne uh for uh, one meter, two meter, maybe, but uh, or through the aircon, but but not not over the seas, <laughs> uh, and and Singapore, given that it's an island country, it's surrounded by sea, it is much easier to control compared to uh to other countries such as Malaysia, where you can't control it's so big and people from uh, surrounding na- uh countries could just uh, ride a sampan and go in, go inside the country without uh, without them knowing. Whereas Singapore, right? Given that it prides its uh, immigration control so proudly, uh, the control measures definitely be easier to put in as compared to what other countries. And it's so small. You see? Um, so, what's what's your thought uh, in in terms of the people, the the government, or the multi ministerial task force not uh, taking caution? To, to restricting import cases because uh, what Lawrence Wong said yesterday was also that we cannot close the borders permanently but I think what people want is not permanently but to, to make sure that the, the risk is mitigated especially from uh, countries with high risk what, what's your thought? Um, let me try to answer your question by going back to decision theory again uh. yeah. um, you have to think about uh, how serious the consequences can be, right? You know, and when it comes to COVID nineteen, of course, you know the consequences uh, as you put it up of of opening uh, mm-hmm. can be extremely severe. As you can see, many countries that uh, open up eventually, you know, had big surge and then had to lock down again. Now, the other thing, of course, you have to think of eh, then uh, what is the probability? Of this happening, okay, and I think that's a no-brainer because there's so many examples of other countries who opened up and then they had a surge in cases and they locked down, you know. So uh, my answer to your question is, uh, maybe I don't know they uh, never uh, applied decision theory, uh, you know, conscientiously or, or whatever. Yeah. Mm, so. We, we, we just published, TOC just published an article that's about uh, Lawrence Wong's defense saying that, oh, he, he tried to say that, oh, we need all these migrant workers in, uh, from India uh, for the purposes of uh, essential service such as construction, uh, you know, FMB and etc. But if you were to look at the figures, um, over the, um, so four days prior to the lockdown, which was 23rd of April, just four days before, we have a um, total of 37 uh, cases uh, uh, originating from uh, in India. And out of the 37 cases within the four, uh, seven, four days, six of it, well, only six of it was work permit. Because we know that uh, F&B service, uh, F&B service uh, construction, all this falls under work permit. And yet you, the other 31 passes are made out of work passes meaning SPAS or EP, and and you have people who are PRs, people who are uh, long-term, short-term passes. So I think Lawrence Wong's uh, um, statement saying that, oh, the, uh, the borders should, should should remain open because we need all these services is, is, is quite misleading in a sense. Yes, yes, mm-hmm. I agree with you. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, uh, it's understandable when you say uh, we have to open to allow essential workers to return like those in uh, construction or marine uh, sectors uh. but as you have cited the statistics how come so many other people coming in who are not deemed to be essential you know correct uh, even uh, people who are not coming back to to, to for work for work you know yes. yeah so actually i cannot understand this one 
it's uh, it's funny, but it's uh, the it's the seriousness of it is not funny. <laughs> and and the thing here is the the multi task force cannot say that oh we we can't uh, as as what they did last year to say that oh we can't make decision based on hindsight. But the thing is the it's clear that uh, as in I believe February last year that they were slow in implementing the border close down uh, lockdown uh, with China. Uh, and and what we see today is the same thing. It's only when when there is a res a clear resurgence of cases from India, which spur them to to implement the lockdown, rather than uh, say other countries, New Zealand for example. The moment you see a case, you in just restrict their borders. I. I uh, of course, there's a lot of people who say, "Oh, what?" Uh, for example, the NMP Kelvin uh, Kelvin Cheng, who who say that, "Oh, we we can't uh, lock down. What will happen to the economy? Economy? Uh, I believe there was a comment was written by him. Uh, com- uh, economy is more important than personal safety. Something like that uh, along along that line. So." Why is it that we are putting the economy, given that we have one point four eight trillion in in reserve in national reserve, that we are risking the uh, personal safety of uh, of of the people uh, over benefits, which I'm not sure whether or not the general populace will, will benefit, because uh, are, are they people would be- people benefit from uh, the use of migrant workers, or would it'd be better that Singapore as a whole make use of this opportunity uh, or, or this unfortunate instant to restructure its economy, to be less dependent on uh, migrant workers. Yeah. I think um, what is perhaps uh, obvious from what has happened so far is that we, we seem to be a bit off balance, uh, you know, right? I mean, of course, you need to balance, uh, you know, the economy going up and mm-hmm. then the safety of the people. Uh. But I think it's, it's more or less, if you, my view is that it, it seems to be a case of we focus too much on the science, uh, but uh, very little common sense. Uh. Let me give you an example. Uh. The science may tell you, okay, you can let anybody come in more or less. Uh. As long as you quarantine them, them for 14 days, then it's very safe, right? I mean, that's what the science is telling you, right? But common sense will tell you, but that has not been the case, right? So many countries in the world, when they open after quarantine or even in the quarantine, still the cases can spread, you know? So we, we need to have, uh, in a sense, more common sense and not just to rely on the science uh, when we make our decisions on, you know, uh, how to balance uh, the, the, you know, the, shall I say, uh, the left and the right the of the decision making, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, you so the on the fourteen days, I think the, one one of my criticism on on how the Singapore government is tackling this problem is that they are going back to the same assumption. They going back to the same assumption back uh, what they had in uh, again February March last year that oh we can fight this uh, virus like SARS. Uh, so long we have temperature uh, temperature taking right. Oh, uh, we can fight it like what we did. 14 uh, was it 17 years or 14 years ago uh, and today and, and that resulted in the outbreak of th- or, or having thousand over people in, in one day and today they are falling to the same trap again that oh so long we quarantine this uh, uh, people for 14 days uh, we could just bring in everyone uh, we, we could still succeed because we have already this control measure of this 14 days and we clearly, uh, uh, you know, what's happening now tells you that uh, that is uh, a wrong uh, decision to have to be made, lah. You know, and, and I just want to add, uh, you have so many cases that are like unlinked. You know, then you wonder uh, how effective is the trace uh, together. You know, I think one of the problem with trace together is in the beginning the people were assured that you know the trace together will only be used uh, to trace COVID nineteen. And then there was a backtracking and say, oh no no, now we can u- you you can use it to investigate uh, you know criminal activity and all that nah. So I think a lot of people then say, okay lah, then if that's the case, I I I, st- I I stop using, I don't use the trace together no. In fact, uh, there was one uh, cluster I think in Chinatown where uh, the the three family members are all of them never use the trace uh, uh, together. 
So I think we we seem to be lacking in uh, common sense and uh, to be on the on the ground and perceive how people will will, will react you know, to the things that you say. Uh. I mean, why take? My view is this: after you have assured the people that the trace together is only used for COVID nineteen tracing. Why do you have to keep insisting that, oh, no, no, we will only use it for, you know, criminal activities, then we will tell you only very serious criminal activities. But then, don't you realise that a lot of people, the reaction will be, the trust is lost already, Correct. right? Then the consequence is that, you know, the trace together is not effective. Then you, you, it's very hard for you to, to control uh, any outbreak as what we are, we are seeing today. Uh. I believe the uh, mem- members of parliament for Workers' Party may highlighted this. Uh, was it Gerald Giam? That the 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 reason for trace together was simply for the purpose of uh, uh, and allowing the task force to track the um, was it the the outbreak uh, if there was there was any infection uh, to identify the clusters uh, and the source of the infection. But but the government went on and and used the existing law and say that oh no we and try to justify that oh no we can use this uh, uh, this data from trace together in order for us to solve crime, and the thing here is, uh, and and in 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 Drani even asked this question to I believe Yong Ban Wai because the uh, Progress Singapore Party's position is that. Uh, no matter what circumstances, the in, the data cannot be used by the government, other than the purpose of contact tracing, because the promise made to the people was that it was meant for that and it will stay at that. And Indrani countered by saying that, oh, Mr. Leong, uh, is, is Leong right? Uh, Mr. Leong, same surname. Uh, uh, would you say the same thing if this? Uh, evidence can be used to trace, uh, say, a murder or a kidnapping case. You know, that is a slippery slope. That's a, in fact, well, that's a straw man argument, um, uh, saying that oh, I uh, if there was a crime that can be prevented or be be solved with the uh, information from traced together, uh, wouldn't would you still prevent it from me? But you know. If one were to take that argument, of course, uh, one would agree. Yeah, if if say a a young kid was being kidnapped, and one could could trace uh, the the child using the information, one would definitely agree. But but in the first place, uh, but we know that the information that that token could could provide is minimum, as as what the government has shared. The government, on the other hand, has so much other information, such as um, the telcos. The uh, if you have a mobile phone, one could trace uh, trace an, an individual. Know where's this person's last location. If, for example, if this kid is has has been uh, kidnapped uh, and has a phone with her or him, the police would be able to ask the telco to ask uh, to inform what's the what has been the last location based on the um, uh, the the carrier stations, uh, and to trace where what is the where is the possible uh, position that this person will be, and not say rely on oh, what's the trace together. That that's really going down the the, the end. And you have so much CCTVs around, right? One would. Say that oh I would rely on the CCTV footage rather than rely on trace together. That's just really going overboard. I think the example uh, you have cited is a clear example of what I would call illogical thinking. No? Uh, I mean you mean before trace together you cannot investigate, huh? like you say all uh, the tools that you have, correct. you know, and yet uh, you use this uh, as a should I say a rebuttal or excuse? Uh, oh that's why we still need to 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 use it. But you got to ask yourself, it's illogical. Right, if the people don't trust and don't use trace together, what is the consequence? <laughs> and we are all living with it now, right? You know, the the economy is suffering, uh, people are suffering, right? All because well, I I don't like to say this lah, but what's the point of winning an argument in parliament where the end result, the outcome is what we have today? It's very sad, you know. If it's we illogical. were to use, if we were to use the same kind of argument, right? It would be oh, uh, we that that so for example, there's a, co- a corrupt case of corruption. Oh. Uh, that means that uh, the uh, the person is not paid enough, so we therefore we should uh, give give more pay, increase the pay, so to actually clamp down on corruption. 
Yeah, but then yeah. you still you still have uh, you still have a fundamental still, mental you, issue. You, yeah, yeah, you still have a lot of corruption, you know, and I mean not. So, uh, you have to go back to I would say uh, what I call illogical thinking again, uh, right? In the first place, you have the wrong person <laughs> doing the job. Uh. It doesn't matter how much you pay him because as the you know history has shown us, okay. Uh, the person there's no there's no limit to the the amount of of money or the amount of, of power that one one may desire you know right so, so going uh, back to the uh, trace and, and, of course, and of course like I said right at the beginning about decision theory when you need to do something that hardly anybody else is doing or you know to such an extreme you could ask yourself why is it that very few people are doing it you know why do other countries not subscribe to this same uh, contact uh, tracing uh, uh, hmm. principle? Hmm. No, I'm I'm referring to uh, oh, high okay. pay, the, right? Yes. Why do other countries not pay their politicians the highest in the world so have to have uh, no uh, less or no corruption? Why are we the only one, right? So hmm. like I said right at the beginning in decision theory, but ask yourself, look, let the numbers do the talking. If most people are not doing it and you're the only person doing it, you got to think very very carefully, you know, yeah. right? What's is so my, unique? Yeah, yeah. Is, <laughs> am I so uniquely Singapore? Is my reasoning mm. sound or not? Okay, and as you know, as history is showing out today, yeah, uh, right. Whether it is the pay or the COVID nineteen, uh, it is it is uh, unsound. It's illogical thinking. Uh. Okay, so uh, okay. Um, let me see. Uh, we are looking. So um, yeah. So we are not trying to say that the uh, vaccine uh, or that the vaccination is is not uh, is not working. Uh, I believe the vaccine is working, uh, which is why we are seeing that little community cases, and also. Um, you know, it, it's scientific proven that vaccine works, and, and of course you have uh, uh, people. No, no, not people. Um, scientific data showing the effects of the. Yes, Singapore is name. Um, uh, they will talk about how. I mean, basically, information about the vaccine shows that uh, it is work. But but then we goes to another question that someone have uh, posed inside uh, about why are we so as in quiet in terms of the adverse effect on the vaccine. I, I think we have to be careful in terms of uh, uh, playing up the effects of the vaccine, uh, playing up the adverse effect of the vaccine, because it, that only scare people from, um, from being vaccinated. Uh, it is, end of the day, it's just a, a numbers game that out of how many people People, certain people would uh, somehow uh, get adverse, uh, especially for people of uh, high risk, people who are uh, old, uh, of uh, of senior age, people with underlying uh, medical conditions, and of course we have um, uh, cases in which they don't have this, but yet they still have adverse effect. Uh, we have to acknowledge that that's the case, uh, but at the same time. We have to be careful in terms of how we look at it. Uh, for, for, uh, I I won't want to put names, but but there are people who 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 who, who are stirring up uh, certain uh, how's that negative uh, impression on on the vaccination. I think we need to take a balanced view uh, in in terms yes, uh, yeah. in, in in the vaccine. We yes. Uh, at one point, we are con we have to be concerned in terms of what might result from a vaccination. But at another point, we also have to be uh, wary of how that kind of information would scare people who are not so um, informed. Yeah, I think I think on this note, uh, by the same token, we have to uh, be concerned about uh, not just overplaying. Uh, but underplaying, you know, I think this uh, arguably may be the fault of our 160th press freedom ranking press media, uh, right? Everything something every time something happens, uh, then when you read the news, uh, it's like oh, it seems they seem to be underplaying, you know, like you know the, the these few days you say uh, oh, uh, despite the you know uh, uh, lo uh, uh, what you call restrictions and uh, circuit breaker or whatever, uh, oh, it's not going to affect the economy, you know, right? Oh, uh, you know, uh, 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 despite uh, the surge in cases, uh, uh, you know, uh, things are it's not it's not that bad, you know, and they always say oh the 
experts say it's not that it's not every like every time they, 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 the the narrative seems to be to downplay the news. Whereas you know you are talking about some people try to so you you see if you have a media that keeps downplaying the yeah. the news the balance then, yeah. yeah then then people don't trust the the media anymore and that will affect the the okay I I just saw the latest statistics at uh, release about the number of people who have uh, vaccinated uh. They, they, they 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 don't seem to be a lot you know right so you have to ask yourself uh, uh, or register yeah why. Mm. Because you know, it's it, we're in the COVID nineteen situation. Uh, uh, it's not about uh, you know uh, you know propaganda. It's about making people feel good, not frighten people, right? You cannot over downplay what's happening, because that can have e- even more dire consequences uh, than the people who are as as Terry has said. Don't mention the name. Uh, who try to overplay it? You know, yeah. right? You you need balance. Okay, uh, otherwise. <laughs> Uh, I hate to say this. Uh, we are doomed, la, Terry. Mm. If we continue at, at you know the this way space, we do yeah. at this rate, yeah. we are doomed. Because when the people don't trust the news, then they will react the way they will react, and and that that is a big problem. La. Uh, in response to Chindi's point, in terms of uh, US have this uh, VAER database. Uh, so it's re- a system in which you report for adverse effect. Yeah, it's true. Uh, it's true. Uh, I I think what people want is transparency, and because there's lack of transparency, that that people would tend to believe that otherwise. It's 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 it becomes a point where uh, people on uh, on the ground would always believe that the government has something to hide, but they just don't dare to say. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, let me just give you an example. Mm. Uh, uh, look at our testing statistics. Uh. Uh, they tell you, oh, uh, how many swaps have been done, you know, what's the average number of swaps. But the most important statistic never come out, you know. How many people, what proportion of the population, right, have actually been tested? I mean, this one, uh, other countries would give it as a, as a norm, you know. But this is, to me, this is the most important statistic, and we don't have it. What's the point of telling me I have so many million swaps, so many million swaps, but I don't tell you how many people have actually been uh, uh, tested. Uh, uh, tested uh. Uh. And, and there are some clues that make you, you know, feel very concerned. Uh. Yeah. You see, they are retesting uh, about 200,000 foreign workers, foreign workers yeah. every, two weeks. Dorms, every two weeks. Yeah. Okay? Now, if every two weeks, then in a month, uh, they are being, they are being <laughs> tested like three times, you know. Yeah. So you're looking at like 700,000 tests on the same people over and over again. Yeah. Right? So we, we, it we, looks we, a lot, but, but yeah, it's, it's we, you're we, not detecting yeah, the whole transparency. We need to know how many people have been tested, okay, and uh, how many people are the, these dorm workers who keep getting retested, and how many people are you know uh, the the rest of the community. And our uh, some a, a person raised the point about uh, like we have been wearing masks for uh, over the year. So when would this stop? Uh, when do we would we be able to stop wearing masks? Uh, and and this is the thing, you look at. Uh, Countries that really effectively um, uh, is controlling this virus: uh, New Zealand, Australia, um, uh, Taiwan. These these are countries that basically you don't have people wearing masks. They and they have huge events, concerts, uh, gathering. Uh, rallies, yeah, but that's uh, a, there's a significant difference. Uh, they don't allow, they don't allow anybody to come in. <laughs> oh no, they I, <laughs> almost I, nobody. I think they they do. Uh, uh, I think. But only for for important cases, essential uh, yeah. essential cases. So they they are, uh, they are, what they do is effectively creating a bubble with the people, and they, they could just go go along with their normal life, and uh, whereas at the same time controlling strict strongly on strictly on on the people who are coming in, and which is why I, I also uh, advocate is not to close the borders, but to ensure a strict. Uh, quarantine regime in which pe- people going out, people coming in, uh, would be heavily tested, and and also g- given the period in which there's no way that they could pass the the virus to anyone in our community, and, and but 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 what we have today is that uh, uh, I'm not sure if I'm right or wrong, but uh, my view is that the government is taking this position that uh, we have to bring in all these people coming in. And we know that there's risk. So the, the way to mitigate this risk is to have 
or you are vaccinated and you're continuing wearing the mask. So if there's communication, then so be it. That, that, that's, the, that's the acceptable risk uh, of uh, allowing the borders to be open. Yeah, on this mm. note, I just saw the news. Don't know whether fake news or not, uh, but I just saw uh, that seashells, the country which is the, has the most vaccinated people in the population, uh, is starting to have a surge in uh, uh, cases. So the science does not definitely tell you today uh, that you know vaccination will you know ensure that the the you know that you won't get it again you know right you know so like the Tan Tock Seng cluster I saw yeah. like you <laughs> know quite a number of the people who got it actually wow. were already uh, you know fully, two dose, yeah. Yeah, fully yeah. vaccinated yes so I uh, I also don't know how to explain that no I mean, <laughs> whilst we're talking about travel bubble don't yeah. you find it strange uh, that Singapore is open to like six or seven countries we have a travel bubble we open to six or seven countries these people can come you knowing to quarantine but they do not reciprocate you no know? that means uh, they can come but we cannot go see? Mm. why do these six or seven countries not not open when Singapore is open to them you have to ask you this question you know why yes um, I just give you one anecdotal, uh, two two uh, anecdotal what I call uh, in anomalies which I find very strange. Yeah? Uh, I had a friend who came back uh, with his son, you know, uh, from from Australia, and uh, he comes, he arrives at Singapore airport, he's tested, and then they are told, okay, uh, you go by yourself, uh, uh, either uh, to your home or to a hotel, uh, wait for five hours. And then, uh, you know, we will we'll tell you the result, you know, uh, if it's negative, then yeah, okay. If it's positive, then you have to go into quarantine. So my issue is this, uh, they are left on their own to take whatever means of transport to go to a home or go to a hotel for five hours. Okay. And, uh, you know, isn't there a, a, a possibility that, uh, uh, you know, while they're waiting for the result in five hours, that the, the virus may, may, may spread or... Or something you know and there was this case i saw where a person actually went to see the doctor and he was told that because of his medical condition the symptoms he had to go for covid 19 test and he refused to take it and eventually he was found positive and all this uh, while you know, he had been running all over the place i mean i always i always thought that uh you know if the doc, if you go to the clinic and you say you must do covid 19 it's compulsory right yes. right so uh, what what these two examples i've cited now uh, are that you know uh, you, 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 when you have a system, you must go on the ground and trace every step of the system. All you need is one leak somewhere, yes. okay? Then the whole system may break down. And on, on that, I, I would like to talk about the mandate that the government has sought. Okay, I wouldn't say the government. Um, the PEP has sought to to get from the people following the general action. People have been uh, against the idea of holding a, uh, a uh, general election last, uh, last year uh, amidst a COVID pandemic, yet the government still went, okay, PAP still went ahead and, and conducted the general election uh, to, as what Prime Minister Lee said, to have a mandate from the people so that they could bring this country forward uh, uh, through this peace pandemic. And, and it's really troubling to see that instead of making decision, hard decision, hard decision that would benefit the people, they seem to be making the hard decision that would see them voted out. <laughs> because if, <laughs> you, you imagine, and, and that's what a lot of people are saying here, where if, if the government, uh, sorry, if the general election were to help to be held this weekend, they would definitely be voted out because the thing is people are not happy that they they are still doing what they want, such as opening the borders, right? Despite people calling for the closure of borders for so long. And, and if I would go more extreme, I would say that all this, the deaths that you see in the hospital, the, 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 all these seriously ill individuals are the result of the government's policy. Because if they, it, the the news report keep trying to point. Oh, the source was from this uh, this nurse, Philippine nurse. This source was this IC officer. But let let us go back to the year. Uh, no, 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 last year when we had fifteen days of uh, no community cases. Of course, they have gotten it from somewhere. It can't cannot be that they they got it from nowhere. Uh, this are uh, patient zero. They so it was irresponsible. Okay, it. It was misleading to put them as patient zero when they clearly have gotten the virus from somewhere else. 
Yes, yeah. I mean, since you are talking about elections and mandate, nah, I believe we are the only country in the world that had an early election nah, in the in the midst of the uh, of the COVID nineteen crisis. You know, I mean, other countries have had a normal election, but I believe we were the only country that had an early election, right? And of course, history oh, tells us yeah. that ah, uh, uh, whenever there's a crisis, the incumbent normally wins, lah. You know, people people are, are afraid. You know, so like Terry says, right? Uh, you asked, you had an early election, uh, p- possibly the only country in the world because you want a mandate to deal with the COVID-19 yeah. crisis. You had the mandate and look and look at where we are today. <laughs> it's a joke, is it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so on, on this issue of COVID, uh, you, you wrote a post about, uh, you wrote a post about uh, the spending, the 100 billion spending on, on the... Um, on for COVID relief, can you talk about this? Okay, uh, as you heard in Parliament, right, that uh, about a hundred billion uh, was uh, you know set aside for the COVID nineteen budgets. Uh. Yes. Actually, the actual figure has been uh, clarified to be like ninety over billion. Okay, but I I could not find the breakdown anywhere. So I took quite some time to you know sift through all the media reports and government reports and try to put put some kind of a breakdown to the 90 over billion, uh, right? I just highlight to you, uh, the, the, okay, this one is of course the November figure, uh, right? Uh, by November of last year, you find that only 148 million of the support grant was paid out. And support grant is for people who are unemployed for uh, at least three consecutive months or had their income cut for at least 30% uh, for uh, three consecutive months. Of course, the subsequently they have budgeted an additional eight hundred million uh, for this. Uh. But what I'm trying to point out is, uh, it's quite uh, startling for me to see that arguably the people who need help the most, those who are unemployed, those who have you know severe cut in income, uh, they're only getting uh, like less than one billion of the entire ninety one billion. Most of the rest are going to other things, uh, a lot to companies and businesses and so on, uh, right? Now let's look at the look at the biggest the, the biggest uh, amount in the breakdown, uh, right? Yes. Is the twenty three point five billion uh, job support scheme, okay? So this one uh, goes to go, it goes to employer to uh, subsidize part of the wages of the workers. So in a sense, it is a support scheme that is focused on helping businesses. Right, rather than directly to the to the worker, huh? you find in uh, in some countries, uh, uh, quite a lot of help goes directly to the worker and not okay. through the the companies, company. Huh? Now you look at the second largest one. So it, but, but be, before we continue, job security scheme, if I'm not wrong, is where the government pays eighty percent of the. No, pay. no, 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 no. Job security scheme is the is the one where. Uh, different sector have different oh, uh, see, see, subsidy, see. right? Yeah. So, for example, uh, now I think aviation sector has the highest subsidy yes. at I think thirty uh, percent or something. Uh. so government will pay thirty percent. So, if you are like arts or entertainment s- sector, I think I think the subsidy now is only like ten percent. The government will help you to pay. Uh. Mm. What you are referring to is the. SG traineeship and the oh. job growth team. That's, that's different. Right? That's actually that is to try, okay. try to create uh, jobs. Okay. Then the you, the you next, see, uh? you have the second highest amount. You see a thirteen billion contingency fund, uh, right? So you know everything. You, you I, I would say look at the balance. Uh, the people who need help the most get you know a few hundred million. Yeah. Okay. Then you have thirteen billion in contingency. Yeah. A lot of money you set aside, right? And to make things worse, last year. Uh, your income cut more than 30% for three consecutive months. You get $5 a month for three months at least. Huh? This year from January, the criteria has been tightened. Your income must cut by at least 50%, you know, in you know, order to get $5 for three months. I mean, I think it's hard enough to have your income cut 30 to to say he must cut more than 50 in order to get $5 for three months. Uh, uh, I think our priorities are, in a sense, misplaced. Huh? You know, the balance is... Is 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 simply you know to me is is not there right yeah. <laughs> so the to sum up the priority seems to be uh, more of supporting the companies itself. The yeah, the, you look at the, most most of it. Uh, you yeah. know, just to look quick uh, uh, run through. Uh, 
uh, enhanced fundraising program, uh, financial support for you know promising startups, you know, uh, you know business digitalization, uh, SME rental, you know, uh, stabilization and support package, uh, right? All these are, 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 are more focused on businesses rather than directly to the to the individual so the, there was a overpayment of the 370 uh, 12, uh, 12 million they have to recover like you know? yeah. but hopefully but the companies are, are still there or they still, <laughs> they still have the money to pay you back right? so but but a lot of people might think that 370 million is a lot uh, when they saw the news, or oh, oh, uh, and some speculate, oh, maybe is the is that's the reason why the Heng Sui is stepping no, down. No, it's uh, a lot because uh, if you look at uh, by November last year, yes. all the the unemployed and the income cut severely, only one hundred forty eight million. Correct, right. it's it, less than uh, half the uh, three hundred no, million. but they you know? think a lot. But then, if you were to look at the actual figure uh, of what this job support scheme has been paid out, that's barely how how, uh, how much percent of uh, the total paid out trend of uh, the stranger of 70 that's less than 4% wise, yeah. the amount of yeah. wrongly paid out yeah. uh, you know it's not a lot yeah. Yeah, but because the, the the overall number is very big so it looks looks like a lot yeah. yes yes it looks like a lot in comparison to the rest more than your support grant more more than yeah, actually uh, just one over percent of the 23.5 a uh, billion uh, 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 billion you know uh, i right. mean everything is perspective la, yes right you see the mayors will say oh, yeah no my pay only 166 years it's only 660,000, right oh uh, because mm-hmm. the highest pay in government is like almost two billion you know everything is relative right yeah, but then if you say, hey, but I got 300,000, uh, you know, uh, uh, resident workers, full time, part time, okay. who earn less than $1,500 a month. Okay. So everything is, is relative. Uh, yeah. okay. okay, let's talk about some questions that people have asked. Uh, oh, no, before we go into that, um, when you mentioned a point about companies subsidizing, uh, sorry, government subsidizing companies. You know, one one troubling one troubling policy I always uh, that that I uh, I always criticize will be workfare, because um, workfare seems to be a policy in which the government rewards or sorry the the government subsidize companies that underpay their workers, because so long the worker earn this much and therefore we would top up in order to meet this this amount, so in a sense. The government is rewarding companies that underpay their workers who, who are unable to meet the wage of a certain level. Well, what, what's your thought? No, the other issue I have with workfare is this. You must be at least 35 years old. Right? You're below 35, then uh, you know you don't qualify for workfare. Right? And the bulk, the other issue is the bulk of workfare goes to CPF. I think for employees, it's like uh, something like only 30% is in cash and 70% goes to CPF. For self-employed, yeah, even worse, one hundred percent of the workfare goes to CPF, right? So it, it it doesn't really help you directly because it's not cash that you can take home and you can you can you can use, you know. Well, some people yeah. would say, uh, if once it goes to CPF, we can use it to pay for a mortgage. Uh, the, not the entire amount goes to CPF ordinary account. Uh, uh, well, much of it goes to like Medisave account and and, and all that. Uh. Yes. But then you have to ask yourself, you know, uh. Uh, all the people who who don't have a mortgage to pay, then uh, how does it help you? Again, all the people who don't have a mortgage to pay, even if I top up yeah. part of it to your ordinary account, uh, uh, how does it help you? No, but that that goes to say how a bit convoluted the 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 system is. Uh, the a lot of the a lot of the uh, schemes, right? It's about subsidies, about yeah, like yeah. So, if I'm single. Uh, it's very likely that I will not benefit from anything of the scheme. Yeah, yeah, uh, correct, yeah. um, uh, you, you, you don't fall sick, yeah. you, you, you don't have a mortgage yeah, to pay, right. uh, you are single or you are below 35, right, you right. Know, uh, then you may get nothing out. Yeah, I won't get yeah. anything. So, so, so I can total everything up as yeah. like one MP say, oh, yeah. on the average, everybody gets 3,000 plus, you know. Right. But there are a lot of people who get zero. <laughs> right. And of course, people will say, that, oh, this, this is uh, like a social system in which you help the welfare. Etc. But the thing is, this is not a... Insurance scheme, uh. yeah, this, it's totally uh, different. You know, yeah. the developed countries don't don't calculate their <laughs> their what you call uh, you know uh, welfare, uh, yeah. uh, help to uh, to the populace like 
like like like this, you know. Yeah. yeah. It should be in individual basis, not not like on average. You know, how 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 we do Yeah, yeah. It. I just give you an yeah. example. I look at the procreation uh, benefits. Uh. Yeah. working mothers, the higher your pay, the you know you get a tax. Uh, you know, uh, rebate. You know, uh, yeah. rebate uh, yeah. and you can get up to eighty thousand dollar a yeah. year. You know, okay. Whereas if you are low, you low income or not working mother, you get zero. Yeah. So if I total everything, it looks very nice, right? Yeah. But then most of, a lot of people, especially the low income one, get very little or hardly anything. So that's on workfare. The um, there there was a a uh, person who asked since you're a financial advisor, uh, what's your thought about uh having the differential in terms of premium for uh gender? So if I'm a male insured, insured, uh, I pay this premium. Well, female insured, I pay this premium. What what's the thought in in uh, in terms of that? Uh, uh, I believe all the government medical schemes are gender neutral. You know, they they they, they doesn't make any difference whether you are male yeah. or, so, or so female. So so her her, yeah. her her question was, uh, care shoe life premiums that di- uh, differed based on gender. So, uh, it's quite weird because. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, 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 I know MediShield Life uh, is gender neutral, hmm. but from the way this person asks, it, it seems that the cashew Life premium is not gender neutral. Be- uh, oh, the- I, mean, I, I, I recall writing an article on that before. Uh, it's, it's because uh, women will live longer. Yeah, but you are na- okay. <laughs> but your national scheme, you know, your yeah. your your national scheme. I mean, yeah. I I. From what I know, I don't think there are any national uh, health schemes in the world uh, where there is a gender uh, difference. Uh. They only apply to uh, private, uh, you know, uh, insurance schemes. I understand uh, uh, around the world and even in Singapore, for government-run national schemes, I I, I think uh, if what this person say is correct, then cashew life must be a very unique one uh, where uh, there is there is what you call a, a gender, uh, you know, uh, difference. Uh. So in the sense. A discrimination against uh, <laughs> uh, you know uh, one uh, one one of the the gender yeah 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 it has it has a difference in the, 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 other, the, other, the other overall overarching problem with our national health scheme is uh, it's a compulsory scheme even the people who live overseas uh, PR and Singapore also must pay you know mm. so why do you need to keep increasing the premium to mm. build up so much reserves uh, that that no other country does one, you know, right? Uh, uh, because it's compulsory. Everybody must pay. Why do you need to increase and have such large reserves? Mm. And of course, bottom line, why can't the actual reports be made public so you can see what kind of assumptions you are you are you are you are using? No, but uh, you know, till today, no actual reports on the medical life. No actual reports on CPF life. It is. It's not the the lacking in transparency in 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 Singapore uh, is so so uh, you know uh, pervasive you know. Yeah. Um, someone asks, uh, can you increase the long hand volume and reduce the other? Um, as to the sound engineer, there's no sound engineer. There's only two person in uh, this room. Uh, so you give me a while. Let <laughs> me adjust the thing. <laughs> well, you see, uh, I'm speaking very close to the microphone already. Maybe my voice, voice is uh, genuinely. Uh, soft lah. Okay. Uh, born like that lah. I'm older. Ma. I'm 67. How old are you, uh, Terry? 38, I believe. 38. Yeah. Uh, no wonder lah. You're half my age. Your yeah. voice so louder. Ma. Yeah. Hey, by the way, uh, yeah. you, you might have noticed Terry. Uh, very slim now. Like, lost all weight. Like. No, not yet. Not yet. Huh? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, that's on that. Um, Sharon asks, why did... Uh, why do you think that the government uh, choose to support the businesses instead of uh, supporting the uh, individuals directly? I have no idea. This one you got to ask them. But then, if I were to, you know, just to yeah, just, just, uh, just, just to make yeah. to make a a, a guess, uh, it is about uh, let the numbers do the talking. Hmm. You see, if you look at those countries that give a lot of help directly to the individual person. Mm-hmm. You cannot see the number, right? But if the help goes to the businesses, ah, you can see the number, you know, right? How many businesses you save? Okay, ah, you know, ah, you know that the uh, uh, business expectation, you know, is is rising, right? There are concrete uh, numbers that you can say, oh, very good, right? But when you give to individuals, 
it's almost it's very hard to measure, you know, right? Let's say mm. I decide that I want to help the most poor thing people la. All the unemployed I like most countries I, I give them a lot more la. But how does this translate into a number that I can, you know, sing a song and say, Hey, you know, <laughs> I, I, I I I this this shows that I, I did a great job. Right? But maybe that's the that's that's one of the possible uh, 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 reasons la. So let me give you an example la. Uh, SG uh, United uh, Traineeship and Skills, uh, you know, job scheme. Okay, uh, it helps to bring down the unemployed numbers. It helps to bring up the employ uh, employment numbers. Okay, but the issue, of course, is after six months of traineeship, will the person really have a job now? And after the company has made use of, uh, in a sense, cheap labor, government pay eighty percent, you know, of the pay. No CPF, no benefit, nothing. Okay, so the number will look very good. Unemployment uh, is much lower. Employment is very much higher. But at the day, is is balance? Is it correct to put so much of your emphasis uh, on this uh, job training and uh, skills scheme? Well, in a sense, make the numbers look good, lah. Uh, I have a sense that often when making decisions, instead of applying all the decision theory that I have been talking about uh, in this program, maybe uh, arguably they may be focusing too much uh, on the numbers to look good. Remember last year when the budget was announced, uh, you have this uh, MP Tim Peiling. Uh, Tim Peiling who is a very good member of parliament uh, and a responsible one. But I, I think she, she she made a questionable comment when she said, Oh, the government is so generous. Uh, uh, if you were to divide uh, among the residents, it will be, uh, I think, 23,000. Yeah, 23,000 uh, plus. Everybody uh, get uh, help, help, <laughs> help from the, from, help from the, the from government. Budget, yeah. If you were to yeah. divide and such. Yeah. But, but people would, would say, uh, I think most people only got 600. Yeah. Uh, most yeah. people got only 600. And actually, yeah. you see a lot of this so called government transfers uh, don't help you. Medi safe top up. It doesn't help you unless you go to hospital, right? Uh, HDB grants doesn't help you unless you are buying a HDB, uh, you know, flat, you know, right? And then uh, you know uh, all kinds of uh, rebates and and subsidies. Uh. you see, what's the point of a rebate and subsidy when the price keeps going up? You know, I increase the price by five percent, I give you a subsidy by four percent. You still paying one percent more. <laughs> From the COVID, I, my my view is that by right there should be a lot of companies. Or I I believe there's already a lot of companies that close down, but there should be uh, more companies that would have to uh, or ought to have closed down because they are, uh, either their business model doesn't work anymore uh, in the new economy, or that they have been over uh, reliant on uh, migrant workers, for example, um, and and the way. Oh, to support this restructuring is not by throwing money like like what the government has always been doing throwing say this grant that grant and what this they have been spending but pass the money to the people pass the money to the people so that they they can decide how they want to spend the money because it's always about the economy uh, the uh, the business rely on the ecosystem to, to survive but you in you inject such artificial funds you create an artificial system which frankly without the support of the government this system will not I uh, uh, putting aside say agriculture agriculture is uh, 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 industry that the government definitely have to support because you have to support the livelihood of people I mean, the sustainers of people but other things for example, aviation tourism, right? And that, that's something that, that, that I don't think uh, the government should be throwing money at. Uh, and especially the the amount that they have been throwing at SAA to prop up the, the, the kind of, But it should have gone bankrupt. My view. Uh, as to your question, uh, there was a very interesting uh, article in The Economist, uh, I think a few months ago, Analyzing uh, how COVID nineteen support uh, was given in the United States versus the United Kingdom, mm. uh, and the, the the point that I think the author of the article was trying to say is, uh, where more of the support goes directly in cash to the people, then uh, personal consumption will be higher. Mm. 
the confidence and the you know this lack of fear of lack of security will be higher, and that the economy will recover uh, faster. We seem to be uh, yeah, going the, in the opposite uh, <laughs> direction. Our personal consumption already historically uh, is very low, you know, so much lower than Hong Kong or, 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 or Malaysia. Uh, uh, and uh, the the problem, of course, is you see, just a classic example of the workfare scheme, right? It's supposed to help people who are low income, but most of the most of the help goes to CPF, yeah. right? Self-employed, hundred percent go to CPF. So you 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 talk to a lot of self-employed people who say. I get actually welfare. I mean, I don't get a single cent. No, it all goes to my go to my CPF. In fact, it all goes to MediSafe for the self-employed. For the self-employed, uh, the workfare only helps uh, when they need to go hospital, uh. <laughs> But but that will go into another issue about the medical system, which we have talked talk, yeah. uh, talked talk before. Um, and what what was I thinking about? We have to write down my stuff. What uh, so. In your view, how should the government have helped spend the budget? Uh, we need to balance. I suggest we focus more on helping the people who need help most. The people who are unemployed. The people who have income cut a lot. Huh? Uh -huh. I mean, uh, don't, like in Chinese, we say, you know, don't throw the rock into the well, you know. I mean, uh, uh, a, a lot of the people who are suffering are like you know private hire drivers, taxi drivers. It's crazy to increase the petrol tax, right? You know, you, you know, I was in the, in the in the Grab yesterday, and uh, the person was telling me it makes it makes no sense because instead of focusing to help the people who need the help most, you're actually making it worse for them. To me, there's, I, I, there's, it's not illogical. It's, it's, it's nonsensical. <laughs> I mean, it's, I, I'm, I'm wordless, you know. I tell you, when it comes to when I see uh, policy uh, decisions, decisions like this, uh, or talking about, oh, I will increase GST, you know, possibly from next year, right? Oh. I mean, it's crazy, you so know. We are every this, so many people period. are dying. You're talking yeah. about increasing yeah. taxes, you know, yeah. and even if you increase at the most, you get more than three billion dollars, uh, and when you have one point four eight trillion in the reserves. And maybe an uh, estimated uh, 74 billion yeah, a year uh, yeah. in the annualized returns, uh, yeah. not counting the 10 world billion of uh, land sales a year. So, I mean, it's all out of sync, you know. Right? Even the primary school boy says, hey, how come like this? Uh, it, doesn't, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't make sense, you know. I mean, Terry, I mean, what? why? Uh, maybe you can help me. Why? I can't. I'm 57 years yeah. old. Uh. Every time I see this, uh, I'm stumped, you know, I'm, I'm blurred. You know, I don't think I, it's I, funny uh, that Hing Sui Kit is telling the people uh, that he will take responsibility for the increase of GST. Yeah, after you say he is stepping down as the finance minister, then he says, oh, I will take responsibility for the decision on GST. Hey, you say you're going to step down, right? how can you take responsibility? Maybe. Right. Uh, he uh, on on that day maybe his left brain wasn't connecting to his right brain. <laughs> because at the end of the day, the final minister, the even if you were to increase this during your term and throw it to the final minister, the next final minister will still have to take out this burden because you're all the same party, you're all the same cabinet. <laughs> you you cannot just assume that oh. Uh, I'm the one who initiated this uh, seven to nine. So oh, actually, your your comment same same cabinet. Now uh, one minister say oh. Uh, I was wordless, you know, when I found out that I was being transferred to another ministry. Uh, I think he also said something like, well, luckily he didn't find out uh, that he has been transferred from a, from the media or something. You know, right? All this sounds very strange to me. Uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> and the, remember at the beginning, of, I think mid, beginning of the year, where Chan Chun Singh said that they would not extend the SG voucher, the SG the discovery voucher. Uh, that was meant uh, that's meant to spend at all this uh, tourist attraction and it's supposed to it's meant from March to June I believe and now it has been extended to uh, December uh, there's this James Bond movie yeah. called say uh, never say never you know yeah. uh, so <laughs> that's that's a lesson to be learned that keeps happening all the time huh? never say never okay apply your decision theory right don't just say you know never say never okay <laughs> Yeah, and you know, I think as a politician, I, 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 I suppose you cannot blame some some people because as a politician, you have to you have to sound you know confident. You have to be sure. No, can cannot never you know right. But uh, like I said, you know, 
focus on decision theory, right? Uh, focus much more on the desired outcome. You know, it's not it's not a propaganda game. You know, yes. it's, at the end of the day, the numbers speaks for itself. No, and we are we, we are we are in a terrible situation now in terms of numbers. No, but it's not just that. It's it's so, it, because if you go back again, right? You also have the other issue about can people believe what they say? It's not about them committing to something. It's about people yeah. public trust. It's the same thing with the trace together token. Who 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 said that? Oh, we will, the trace together will only be used for contact tracing. Yeah. Period. <laughs> this was said by Dr. Vipin Balakrishnan, both at the press conference and also at the parliament. He said category that that was the case. And he had to, to somewhat apologize. I don't think he really apologized. He just said that he was, um, I know, not sorry, but, 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 but uh, it was an unfortunate mistake. Perhaps the lesson to be learned from what Terry has said is, mm. uh, as a politician, don't be afraid to say that uh, you made a mistake. Lah. Uh, don't be afraid that say oh I, I I made a wrong decision. I need to change, yeah. Right. Because at the end of the day, uh the number will do the talking. Focus on the desired outcome. Right. No matter what you say, how you say and then the the, the, the the number is there. You cannot you, you, you cannot run away from the from, from the number, you know. Right? right. Let me give you just one example, okay. We keep hearing the rhetoric. Oh, you know, job growth is very good. You know, uh, resident job growth is very good. Uh, you know, last year we had fourteen thousand nine hundred job growth, but then the 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 number is very strange because if you have fourteen thousand nine hundred job growth last year, and it's not broken down into Singaporeans and PRs, all right. And uh, last year you granted twenty seven thousand uh, new uh, PRs, um, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Uh, those PRs were formerly foreigners, and because they are working, they became, uh, uh, you know, yes, locals. Yes, yes. They get counted in in, in in a sense in the job growth. It's not so simple. Of course, there are there are PRs who die, there are PRs who leave the country. Yeah. Right. But if you just look at the raw numbers, uh, it looks very strange, right? If say 60, 70 percent of the twenty thousand new PRs uh, were converted and became local job growth, uh, then how much of the fourteen thousand nine hundred job growth actually went to you know uh, Singaporeans? Yeah. Right, without transparency, uh, you know, nobody knows. You know, so everybody is working in the in the in the dark. Uh. I hope the people in government are not working in the dark because, uh, like some of my friends in the civil service, you know, I mean, if one if one if, if one uh, ministry doesn't know what the other ministry is doing, then how do they make policy? Uh, I I I have this idea that I a lot of times they don't talk with each other. Uh, for example. High you you have on one side, M, uh, uh, one ministry trying to liberalize the uh, the energy market. Then the other side, you go in church of high to go and uh, build one power plant that that uh, that so <laughs> so the idea that this plant will be used for uh, power generating and and water production and pe people uh, and eventually that. Cause uh, the downfall of high flux. Yeah, interesting yeah. you mentioned high flux now because you know I I was interviewed quite a number of times uh, in Singapore and not a single word what I said uh, actually came out in the media. The only the only time uh, what I said came out was when I was in Hong Kong. I was interviewed by a uh, financial media in 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 Hong Kong. Uh, right. The well, let me just say briefly in one sentence. Okay. Uh, the high flux story is that. Uh, if you look at the numbers, it was already very, very bad, right? You know, before they issued the six hundred million perpetual bonds. Yeah. So the key issues that uh, or other questions I want to ask, uh, since we're talking about high flux, is this: uh, How does the cash flow projection, uh, you know, that was done by high flux, mm. just prior to the issue of the per per perpetual oh. bonds? How did they look like? Yeah. And uh, the underwriter of the bonds, surely they must have done the internal analyst report, you know, looking at the cash flows. Uh, I mean, what, 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 what do they say, right? All we know now is, uh, you know, after a very long period of uh, silence, that various authorities are now uh, still, you know, okay. investigating whether there was any, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, mischief or wrongdoing uh, in, the, in the high flux case. I mean, this is probably one of the, you know, if you count the equity shareholders as well, 
you are looking at uh, almost uh, one point of, uh, the people lost almost like one point five billion dollars. You know, this is probably the biggest uh, in terms of corporate loss. Uh. I just read today that they have another six white knights or something. I mean, how many white knights do you need over the years? No, at the end of the day, there, there's no white knight, and now another six. You know, I mean. <laughs> it's it, it all it, the narrative is always to keep your hopes up uh, but at, as of now there's 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 still no hope uh, because the number is still not there i i really hope that you know I, i've seen so many people who lost so much of their of their of the savings their life saving because they all felt that hey this one cannot go wrong uh, because this one uh, is like you know by DBS. yeah this one be, uh, you know mm. blue chip you know i mean uh, I, uh, I was there at the the honing park uh, protest when the when this thing broke out a lot of people in fact I, close to i think 100 percent of them right, uh, make this statement that the reason why they have so much trust is that it was it was uh, uh, somewhat government linked. Of course, we know that it's really not government, but but the the perception that they had was that it was issued by DBS, considered as a national bank, and it was a uh, strategic resource which was water. But then they were not told that the business making uh, the generate uh, was it? the revenue generating model of this particular pl- uh, plant that they are producing was on power. So in a way, they were misled. Uh, to to believe that oh this is a key earning through uh, distillation this uh, uh, or not not distillation uh, distillation uh, of water to to generate the income and of course that's the issue of that the plant was taken over by the government agency because contractually they can take it over because of the breach of uh, some of the conditions uh. but then uh, you know arguably perhaps morally you ask yourself even if legally contractually you can take over the plant you know uh, you know. Uh, uh, without paying a, a, a single cent, yeah, uh, is it is it is it is it right for you to do so yeah. when you have so many Singaporeans who have lost so much of their money? Yeah. You know, uh, you know, in this in this episode, I mean, legality is one thing. Uh, you know, I think we have to look at the uh, you know the emotional impact. Uh, I've met so many people who are really uh, devastated uh, by this. Uh, you know, a uh, high 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 flux saga. You know, and the fact that it keeps going year after year and year after year, it's like it's the pain. Uh, is you know keeps uh, going on. There seems to be no 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 closure. You know, Sharon asks um, on on the issue of ideology. So like uh, the government seems to favor uh, supply side of the economics, which would refer to companies instead of uh, the demand side, which is customers or the people. My thoughts on that is that the the ruling party uh, doesn't want the power to be on the ordinary people. They they would uh, because the uh, the current status quo would be that the ordinary people only have power during the general election, where one man one vote, or everyone's equal. But but putting aside, you, if you go outside of election period, everyone becomes not equal. <laughs> where where you have people who have the uh the resources to uh, sue your pe- uh, until your pants drop, and uh, people who can't even afford uh to uh to what send their kids to school, for example. Um, uh, you, you have this disparity, and uh and. And my my thoughts is that that the ideology that the, the I the government keeps you alive, but not to empower you to make decisions. So you have to go back to to what I said earlier in terms of everyone's equal during general election. When people are uh, at the election booth, what are their paramount uh, import? Uh, paramount factor in terms of determining who to vote for putting aside whether or not this candidate is a viable candidate or not the question that they would have is uh, for some people with uh, significant burden financial burden is that whether can I get a job whether uh, would I have enough to fend for my family if this person were to be in a situation where this is not a constitution, then you have a higher tier in terms of wants, which is I want to have a more equal society. I would want to have a more uh, country that, that focus on certain values, certain principle before even going even further. So, so 
always keeping the people in one uh, the needs uh, tier would 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 ensure that uh, that uh, the policy how's it the chips that the gov- that the ruling party have the incumbent party have will always be there because the moment people stray past this thing meaning I don't have to re- rely on the MP to write into the ministry for uh, for support uh, to to uh, to grant this particular subsidy for example or this uh, allowance I, I would not be beholden to them I would simply have to just uh, based on my conscience and, and vote on who I think would bring the country to a better state but in, in the current circumstances you, you are in a situation where People are very afraid that if they were to vote for a certain person, all what they have uh, that is not entitled, all these are just, uh, are just uh, they believe to be promises made by the, uh, by the party that they would get if they were to have the incumbent power. And, and so it, it becomes not just ideology, but in terms of a benefit, uh, in terms of an advantage to the uh, incumbent. Wow, Terry, you sound like a police chieftain speaking an election speech. Yeah. Eh? <laughs> okay, but yeah. anyway, Sharon, I, I generally uh, tend to uh, agree with you. Uh. I mean, if you look at uh, pre-COVID 2019, uh, Singapore's economic growth was only one point something. Eh? It was like the lowest uh, of all the ASEAN countries, if not many of the Asian countries or in, in, in the world. Uh. And look at all the big numbers, the spending that we announced, uh, 100 billion on climate. Change. You know, yeah. what, water to level. prepare for climate change. Yeah, not, yeah, not yeah. Climate, okay. Yeah. Twenty over billion on infrastructure, right? All the big numbers. What does it mean, uh, right, to the common man, right? Uh, just to cite you one classic example: minimum wage don't have. Yeah. Okay. So strongly uh, against. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, uh, you look at the numbers, right? You have. Uh, 300,000 people uh, full-time and part-time uh, residents uh, earning less than $1,500 a month. You less the typical 20% CPF employee contribution, you're looking about $1,200 uh, you know, a, a month take-home pay. Right? The progressive wage model doesn't work for a lot of people because part-timers uh, you know, uh, don't apply to them. Right? So we need to have a per hour minimum wage like what practically uh, every other country has. Developed country. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. you know, because otherwise then uh, the lower income, the lower strata of society uh, will continue to struggle. Uh, how do I pronounce the name? Uh, C.C. Wong, is it? Uh, ask, ask whether or not, uh, if one were to sell the HDB, is it realistic or feasible to rent uh, a house in Singapore uh, for long term, just like in the West, it's common to rent instead of owning a property? What's your oh, okay. Mm. You know, I understand the cheapest HDB flat you can rent, which is three room, right? In the most remote area, maybe, is maybe about $1,000 you know, uh, $300 or something. That's the low, low, lowest, lowest, sorry, must be some very Ulu area or whatnot, right? So you have to, your question is, can I sell my HDB and survive on rental? So you can ask yourself, right? Uh, can I afford the 1,300 uh, rental or not? You see, if so many people earn, uh, as I've cited earlier, don't really earn so little, they, they simply cannot afford the, the rental, right? $1,300 a month, even this is, no, the lowest room rental, I understand, uh, right, is about $500. Okay. Now, of course, if you qualify, you can rent from HDB, la, you know, $26 to uh, 200 plus or, or, or something. Uh. But generally speaking, from my experience, uh, especially doing financial counseling, uh, right, uh, a lot of people uh, who sell the HDB flat and think they can afford to rent, uh, uh, you know, eventually ends up into Homeless. serious uh, <laughs> problem like homelessness yeah. because the rent keeps going up, yeah. right? And for many people, the pay, the pay is not going up. I just cite you one example: uh, ITE uh, graduates, uh, you know, fresh graduates starting pay. Okay, uh, nineteen ninety nine, one thousand five hundred dollars. Two zero one nine, twenty years later, one thousand eight hundred dollars. 
negative real increase of 0.6%. You just talk to all the older people around you, right? Ask them, what was your pay, you know, uh, 10, 20, 30 years ago? And what was the price of HDB flats uh, 10, 20 years compared to now? What's the rental, you know, uh, 10, 20 years compared to now? The wages are not catching up with the cost of living. And it's not just the uh, housing, it's, it's, it's almost everything. You know, on, on this point that, that you know, Wang actually pointed out, I always have this view that uh, the the HDB system is something that really hampers people uh, in terms of uh, seeking job opportunities because in in most developed countries what happens is I will find a job and then find a location that's close to this this particular job and I start renting and what allows that is uh, your rent is uh, affordable and uh, and you're not buy, uh, bound to a, a permanent fixture whereas in Singapore uh, say a, a couple uh, at the um, early 20s uh, buy a HDB flat, fly a HDB flat, uh, buy in Tampines, subsidy get a job in Jurong. So because I'm, I'm, I'm bound to this this property, right? I have to travel <laughs> travel in such a manner, every day one hour commute, or I don't know, I think one hour 30 minutes commute uh, to and fro from home because uh, my job is there, my my home is there. Whereas in, in the ideal situation would be uh, I, I was originally living in Tampines I would uh, drop my rental uh, and change over to Jurong and, and then uh, have a shorter commute the thing that, that uh, prevents things from happening is yeah, your comment to buy HDB fat and then the high cost of rental um, what, what was your thought in terms of the rental because it, it, it it really, I find find it hard to understand uh, why the rental is so high. When say in other countries, you you you're, you won't be having a case where your mortgage and rental is at the same rate, right? Uh, by the way, uh, there are about twenty, I think five thousand or more, uh, completed private property that is vacant, yeah. right? I think Singapore is 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 a situation where. A lot of people, uh, you know, they call them elites or what. Uh, they 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 have the money to own property. Yeah. I don't even need to rent it out. You know, right? You know, they can just just sit on it, uh. Let me just give a general, uh, you know, uh, tip uh, on financial decisions. Uh, too often, I think people don't focus enough on the risk. They focus on the current situation, the current number, or the returns, uh. You must give more weight to focusing on the risk. Let me let me just give you one example, a very common one. Now you see a lot of videos, a lot of uh, you know uh, you know um, online and whatever website they tell you, oh, uh, <laughs> you shouldn't you shouldn't use your CPF to pay for your house. You know, you should use cash because. Why should you keep cash in the bank and get 0.1% when you can get 2.5% from your ordinary account, right? And, uh, you know, top up your CPF as much as possible and transfer as much as possible to the, the special account because you get higher interest. You see, all this rhetoric is focusing on the returns. You're not focusing on the risk. Let me explain. If you lose your job and you can't get one for a long time and have been using all your cash to pay for your house, uh, Right, you know, right, and not your CPF. You may not, you may not be able to put food on the table, you know. You know what I mean? Not you need to, you need to focus on the risk, not just the return. Yo, yeah, I can get higher interest, right? Or you know, people, oh, I transfer all my money to the special account, higher interest. Then one day you find that oh, you are uh, you know you have a disability, you cannot work, so you have no cash uh, uh, coming in. Then you need to a CPF ordinary account to pay for your mortgage. Eh, but you transfer most of it to the special account, which you cannot use to pay for your mortgage. You know, so don't just look at the returns, the the current, uh, you know, better returns or whatever. Focus on the risk as well, right? Because the risk is the one that will really hit you and your family hard, uh, right? And not just this little bit of extra interest that you are you are getting. So that's on private property. So oh, HDB uh, same as well. Uh, yeah, HDB. Yeah. What, 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 one if we talk about policy, right? Because going back to what I said, where people can choose to rent near where they they work, right? Why don't HDB uh, come with rental policy? 
whether like a uh, five ninety nine year ownership because ninety nine year really commitment is really there. No, it's very simple. Uh, uh. Uh, they just need to change the policy and say your CPF can be used to pay for uh, HDB yeah. rental. Uh. You know, I we do financial counseling with volunteer. We have met so many people. They struggle like crazy to pay for the HDB rental lah. Even though it's like, you know, uh, 20, 50, 100, 200 dollars, they struggle like crazy, you know, right? If only they can be allowed to use their CPF uh, to pay for the HDB, but it will take a big burden, uh, you know, off, off their hands. So you see a lot of people, very low income, they, in a sense, they are forced to buy a HDB flat because the CPF cannot be used to pay for rental. So what choice they have? Okay, la, then buy a flat, you know, then I can use a CPF to oh. pay. But then you must see, from a risk perspective, low-income people have a much higher probability in the future of losing right. their job, you know, long term of so unemployment, uh, reduced income, right? You know, then they can't pay for the HDB flat that, you know, they had to buy, right? In order to have a roof over their head, then what happens? Then they can't pay, they lose their, they lose the HDB flat, right? And uh, if the market is down, they may lose all the CPF and the cash that they've used for the HDB flat as well. And of course, Particularly for this group of people, they don't have much else left uh, in terms of you know savings. Uh. So you know much of it goes in the HDB flat, which come ninety nine years becomes worthless. All the CPF gone, all the cash gone. I mean this is why I call the really jalat group you know of the lower income Singaporeans. Uh. They have no choice, right? They have to buy a flat. Right and after forty years, the value starts going down. And ninety nine years, everything goes up in smoke. You know, Sharon brought a, a point about whether should we review your housing value. I think it's based on what we have said said so far. I I also have this view that that we should the importance here is about having a roof over your head. It's not about uh, it's not about home uh, home ownership. It's not about asset appreciation because a lot of people buy into this idea that oh, I need to buy a flat in order to. Uh, for uh, for purpose of investment, for purpose of passing that that uh, property to another uh, to my next generation, but clearly this is this is not the the ideology at this uh, uh, what we have today, isn't it? Uh, when when a couple buy a flat, I'm not going to pass it to my three kids and right? uh, say, "Oh, you three share share within your three, or and you will stay here for the next uh, the fifty years." And very likely, all these three will, will go and get their own flats and, and, and themselves, and. Uh, I believe there was statistics sharing how, uh, about how kids, uh, how children would, would stay with their parents until they uh, they get married, and in a way, it somehow delays the maturity of the 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 children, where you don't have the children able to move out and uh, have a place to rent, because in Singapore the rent is just doesn't justify uh, doesn't justify. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, our in you know, arguably our housing policies, especially our public housing policies, is one of the biggest mother of all our problems. You know, because uh, we have uh, possibly the most expensive public housing uh, in the world. If you you know look at it as a multiple of in of income, you know, so it is a big burden for a lot of people. Right, that uh, okay. Let me take take the situation now. Uh, uh, I saw the latest uh, estimate, uh, some survey they did, like I think uh, 20 or 30 percent of people who have a mortgage uh, have a problem paying the mortgage due to COVID-19. And they are, of course, taking all the, the deferral scheme uh, that allow them to defer the payment of the mortgage. But the deferral is only for uh, a maximum of one year. Mm. Right? So what, what happens next? after after one year? Yeah. If they still can't pay, will they lose their, you know, Woods lose the roof over their head. So uh, we have, <laughs> and, and coming back to the main topic of today's discussion, uh, in COVID-19, uh, arguably, we cannot focus too much on opening up, allowing foreign workers to come in, or as Terry pointed out from the statistics, uh, allowing non-workers to come in also, because the consequences is, is, is very serious, right? Uh, we are now going to another, you know, uh, kind of a lockdown. If this continues, then what about all these people who can't pay their mortgage, uh, mortgage uh, and the one year, you know, deferment is up? It's, uh, <laughs> it's the, you know, the, the mortgage crisis may come very quickly, you know? Yes, Nick. 
And let's uh, answer a last question since uh, we we were trying uh, whether one and a half hour will work better than one hour. So we are saying, I, I don't think freehold is a solution. Uh, f f f is freehold a solution? No, right? No, uh, it's, no, it's, no. No, it, it's no. Uh, because you say you see you see uh, uh, you say freehold the uh, you know the the. You upset the, the entire. The problem will go the, 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 uh, You know you. You see, you 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 don't want to have a situation that okay. I have this problem, so I come up with this solution to stop yeah. this problem. Yeah. But to stop this problem may create much no, bigger no, no. Uh, uh, problems. You know, right. right? We need to tweak the lever very slowly because every lever will turn. Uh, you know, other uh, 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 levers. Uh, like we have said. Uh, you know, uh, uh, many times. Uh, don't make a hundred eighty uh, degree uh, turn. turn. Yeah. Uh, I would like to just uh, go to Stanley Teo's uh, question uh, on whether Medifun should be used to pay for those people who suffer from adverse effect after COVID-19 vaccination. The thing here is, if by right, by right, if, if your uh, adverse effect is a result of the vaccination, uh, there, I believe the compensation will be uh, there will be support financial support for. Uh, but so far, I haven't read the news of a single case that has qualified for <laughs> <they have laughs> qualified for <laughs> compensation, <laughs> right? And, and, you know, and, and, this, and this is a problem. Uh, uh, this is a problem that statistically that, uh, uh, unbelievable. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and I, 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 I have heard of a case where they want to seek legal uh, advice on on what to do. Uh, the issue. Here is that the if the hospital is unwilling to to certify that your adverse effect is as a re, is a result of the vaccination, then you have to go and find your you have to pay for uh, independent in the medical experts right to 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 certify that this is indeed. And then the question is who there? <laughs> right. Okay. I mean, I, no. I, I, mm. uh, this is an interesting question uh, because you must understand uh, Medifund uh, is designed in such a way that it helps people who cannot pay pay if you are in uh, B2 or Class C uh, you know, uh, medical treatment. Uh, uh, so it's not, it's not based on the, the medical problem that you have. Mm. So what you're asking is, oh, as long as due to COVID-19, the Medifund should help me even though I have a lot of money. Mm. So I, 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 that's an entirely separate uh, uh, issue, uh, right? Uh, in fact, if I, as I understand it, for many countries, uh, uh, if you are hospitalized for COVID nineteen, it's free, la, like, You know, right? Because the issue in Singapore is somebody has to say that the the cause is due to COVID nineteen uh, in the in the in the first place. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And and I. I I so so I tell my friend was telling me a joke, you know. Uh, Go hospital, then they ask you, okay, uh, you know, what what was wrong with you? Then the person, no no, can you please tell me uh whether it's COVID nineteen or not? They say I cannot tell you. You cannot tell me that I I I I I, I, I go home lah, uh, because the, then I I then I I either have to pay a lot of money or or what you know. So so it's like catch twenty two, you know, right? Yes. Uh, uh, I need to know because I know whether I have. I have what, free what? treatment. <laughs> I get compensation, right? But you, you cannot tell me that. I, you know, so, <laughs> it's it's funny lah in in, in Singapore uh, that uh, you have a situation where uh, it's amazing, right? Don't you think? Uh, after so long, uh, not a single case reported the media uh, of a person uh, having a uh, you know a serious a yeah. hospitalization due to COVID nineteen. Except the eighty eight year old who died uh, last week. That one I think is very obvious, right? Due to COVID nineteen, right? That because it classified as COVID nineteen. But then no, the, that's death mm. due to COVID nineteen. Yeah, but, but, but then it's, it's it's funny. Yeah. The entire media was silent as to what is the compensation when you die due to COVID nineteen, right? I think it's uh, is it two hundred fifty thousand or something? No, no, there's no one. There is yeah. You died COVID nineteen. You get you. That's I think that's compensation. No, you see it's funny, right? Is the, the first case ever. Then you you completely forgot about the the compensation. You don't don't mention it, no, right? So uh, th this whole thing about media, you know, playing down the the problem, it doesn't help hmm. because nobody believes uh, that there isn't a single case so far that has been you know uh, due reported. to vaccination. Yeah, due, due, due to, to vaccination, yeah. not not due to COVID. COVID there's already uh, thirty one cases. Uh, we need. Ah, yeah. Uh, so, sorry, my my mistake. Uh, I mean, due to vaccination, then died. Then yes, of course got yeah. two hundred fifty thousand. Yes, yes, yes. So this one is died in the hospital, but this one caught the co COVID. COVID in the, complication. Ah, uh, uh, caught the COVID in the yes, hospital. Yes, okay, so yeah. so caught COVID in hospital, no compensation, ah. Uh. No. no uh, okay. Uh, no, no, no compensation. Oh, no uh, wonder. Uh, yeah. people very scared to go to hospital. I understand now. 
this. But anyway, uh, uh. I read in the news that uh, anybody who has been to Tan Tock Seng uh, from <laughs> April 18 uh, uh. is not allowed to go to any other of the possible. public hospital. Yeah. Uh. So, uh, you and know. if you are the staff, so you have the uh. staff, you have, you have been uh, uh, in the patient in Tan Tock Seng, uh, you are your butt. So people were asking, or oh, what if I'm I have a medical appointment in somewhere else? What happens? <laughs> they don't care lah. You have yeah. to go somewhere else yeah, la. you, right. you you don't figure your way out. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think that one the the point of question I think would skip because that would <laughs> that would go quite far. So. We have reached to the end of the live chat today. Um, so if you have any question, uh, write to us. Do not <laughs> post in the comments. We will not be looking at the comments. Um, so hope you all enjoy today's live chat. Uh, do join us again next Wednesday, uh, 1 p.m. Uh, we would try one and a half hour. Uh, let me end by saying uh, that this COVID-19 search now, uh, is affecting me also, huh? <laughs> okay. Right, goodbye everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs> yeah. mm. yeah, let me